All right, Lush. What's going on? Lush. You, uh, you're actually on uh, another channel on YouTube. You're on- uh, Yes. No Jumper, right? Yes, sir. How, how long have you been there? Been in No Jumper for a little bit, about like seven months. But recently it's been with a lot more frequency and I've been added to the, the main podcast, which has been pretty cool. cool. But I've been, you know, I've been on YouTube for several years hosting rap battles and, you know, as a hip hop artist as well. Tell me where you grew up. West side of Los Angeles. Like the real West side. The real West side. I mean, it depends on who you talk to. That's right. There's varying def definitions of what the West side is. If you talk to gang members, it's anything West of the 110. Yeah. And then there's West side, South Central. If you talk to affluent white people, they think it's everything West of the 405. Yeah. But right. But I'm, you know, literally the Sawtell district of West Los Angeles near Palms yeah. is where I grew up. And tell me about your family growing up. In Baldwin Hills and all that. Uh, my family, uh, my dad's a filmmaker. Um, my mom was a producer as well of plays. I'm basically for as far back as my lineage goes, it's all people in entertainment and activism. Um, and, you know, like my parents marched on Washington back in the day and all that. Um, it's kind of crazy because my parents, I have two older brothers, they're 12 and 14 years older than me. So essentially it was like, having two uncles and they both left the house when I was really young. And uh, um, my parents were like, around my age now, they're like 40 when they had me. So I think they kind of expected to have, they already knew how to raise kids. They had it all figured out. This third kid was just gonna be easy and a breeze to take care of. And it was kind of the, what wound up happening was the polar opposite of that. Did you finish high school? I did graduate high school by the grace of God. Um, I wound up getting expelled. I was banned from LAUSD, was expelled from three different high schools, and I wound up graduating from a school um, which was basically like if your parents had, it was like half special needs, half like if your parents cared enough about your future in education, they will put you here and you're damn near guaranteed a high school diploma. On top of that, I was also, um, sleeping with the secretary. She was like my same age, we were both 18, and she gave me answers to a lot of the finals. That helps. Yeah, but I mean, like, the, the, the school, the graduating class was like 15 kids. It was a, it was like, they allowed us to smoke cigarettes in the front. It's crazy, because the, the school, it was actually in the valley. It was like near the Sherman Oaks Van Nuys border. And now, it formerly was a dentist office before I went there, and then when I, you know, after I graduated, like 15 years later, whatever, it's now like a medical cannabis dispensary. And uh, I was like, that's crazy. They're selling weed there now because I was doing it fucking 15 years ago. How would you, how would you describe your childhood in general? Um, I come from a loving home. My parents were very attentive, although my dad was gone a lot working. So I spent the, a lot of time outside and alone and just kind of like intermingling with the kids in the neighborhood and, and all that. So it was, for the most part, pretty good though. But you took a different path than your, the rest of your family. Very different path. They're all like hyper achievers. My oldest brother, he had, you know, he was a drug addict as well, but he got sober when he was 20 years old. And like the height of his addiction was, you know, he almost got expelled from Princeton, he was went to an Ivy League school and like that was as, I, I don't wanna undermine his struggles because he definitely went through it, but you know, ever since then his, his life has been, and even before then, prior to like his two or three years of getting fucked up, he has just like a pretty charmed existence and he's very, very successful. My other brother wound up, you know, following in my dad's footsteps and being a filmmaker and me like, you know, I'm kind of been a, perpetual disappointment in the black sheep of the family. What do you think that is? Is it genetic? Is it something that you went through? Um, well, you know, there's, I suffered a lot of abuse um, at an early age that I wasn't really aware of until it was identified years later. Um, By who? There was, so when I was like five years old, there was a babysitter, a female babysitter that, um, put hands on me 
in a sexual way. And um, there's a couple similar incidents to that. Um, when I was a teenager, I was, I slept, um, slept with a woman. I was seduced by a woman that was a lot older than me. She was like in her late thirties. I know a lot of people hear that and be like, oh, that's cool. Like you got laid, what do you mean? But it wasn't like a woman that I would normally ever pursue or choose to sleep with. And she like kind of preyed on me and got me drunk. And you know, there's several incidents like that. Uh, even there's a little girl that I used to play with. And I, when I was around that same age, like four or five years old, um, and, uh, I think she must have been abused as well because when I would be, when I would like go over to her house, like she would kind of like, we play like games for, you know, it was, there's a whole bunch of things that happened to me. I don't know if that's the sole reason I became an addict, but that definitely is something through therapy that I've identified years later. This is my first time ever actually speaking on it. And it's, you know, something that I'm kind of embarrassed about and feel self-conscious about, but. Yeah, it's something you're out of your control though. Something completely out of my control. But, uh, you know, my, my dad being gone a lot, me being essentially outside, um, my mom not being able to control me. When my when my brothers were raised in the west side of LA in the 70s, it was a much more idyllic time in in, in California, and there there wasn't the gang infestation. There wasn't you know this is prior to the Ronald Reagan crack cocaine era and all that. And you know like the, it was a much safer place to live. And I was kind of coming of age in a dangerous time in the city during the, you know, the, the LA riots and all these extreme racial tension and all this crazy shit. And I was kind of outside thrust in the mix, midst of it. And I never really, my mom wasn't able to get me to come home. I wouldn't listen to her. My dad would come home after being gone for several months and try to like assert some type of authority. I wasn't really trying to hear it, um, you know, wound up falling in with a crowd that, you know, was uh, started do doing graffiti and, you know, my little crew became a gang and all that at a, you know, during my early teen years, I got arrested for the first time. I, I, I got started getting fucked up when I was 12, just smoking and drinking. Um, a lot of kids, my, and it was normal for kids my age where I was from at that time to be already like sexually active, trying to holler at girls and stuff. I, I was trying to, I didn't, wasn't able to get laid until I was like 14, but I was definitely trying to at that age before I could even like really bust a nut or anything, you know? Um, I, I got arrested for the first time at 13, drinking 40s in an alley in Westwood behind uh, the in and out um, 16, I wound up getting arrested, and um, this is in 1998, and I got caught for. I was basically trying. I was basically trying to tag up a building, but they said um, vandalism, trespassing, and I had three dime bags of weed on me. So they said possession with intent to distribute. Was I going to sell it or smoke it? I mean, it doesn't really matter. Like probably both. But at that time, you know, marijuana was far more stigmatized. So they considered that those three counts and tried to give me a felony. But instead of sending me off to a regular juvenile facility, they sent me to a place called Anacapa by the Sea. If you're between 35 and 45 years old and um, were an adolescent in Los Angeles and had a lot of severe drug problems, you might know about Anacapa. A lot of people got sent there. It was, it wound up getting shut down by the state of California, but for, it was a full lockdown juvenile facility, but it was, had a, like a heavy emphasis on substance abuse and things like that. And um, that kind of became drug boot camp for me. And I was perpetuated my addiction significantly. In addition to that, like, you know, I got my first serious girlfriend who was um, a, run, a runaway, who was suicidal. Um, she ran away from her home in Westchester with her boyfriend and they went all the way up to Seattle. They wound up getting arrested, sent back down to Anacapa and it's where we met and um, fell in love. Like the most, I wouldn't even say we were soulmates, we're more like scar mates essentially. And um and uh, she kind of had me flipping my whole script. She was like gothic and shit. So I'm like, damn, I gotta, 
I got to like enter her world. So I started like, I've always been a hip hop head, but I started listening to like Nine Inch Nails and Skinny Puppy and trying to like, you know, get into more like gothic things and shit to, um, to keep her attention. She was really, really beautiful. She wound up being like in the original Suicide Girls book a few years later when she was old enough to, which is, I always thought it was tight. Like my first girlfriend was an OG Suicide Girl. Um, uh, shortly after then, I wound up getting expelled from high school and then had a series of expulsions. Like the first time I, I got expelled, I was already on like triple probation. And the only reason they hadn't expelled me yet because my mom was super active in the PTA and things like that. And uh, I got caught doing graffiti on a different school's campus and all this other shit, but they didn't expel me. But I wound up getting, um, wound up getting, you know, happy days, you know, the Fonz. The Fonz's son, he was like a freshman and I was a junior. And uh, there's a lot of Hollywood kids that went to the school I went to at the time. And uh, I thought it would be funny to get him drunk. So I got him drunk for his first time doing during uh, lunchtime, came back. Kid puked in art class, wound up snitching me out. I get expelled. Went to um, uni high, wound up getting caught smoking weed, right basically adjacent to the campus, got expelled from there. And uh, the rest of my high school was pretty dysfunctional, like all different kinds of crime. Like I was, you know, hitting a lot of licks, um, even like some car theft, all kinds of crazy shit that I'm lucky to have never really got caught up for. Um, wound up between the ages of 16 and 19, though, I was in like 10 different treatment centers. Um, when I was 18, I was supposed to, it was like the summer before I'm supposed to go to college and my dad was making a film overseas. I'd been selling ecstasy before that and popping a lot of ecstasy, like on a daily basis. Not like just partying with it. I'd like wake up in the morning and pop an e-pill and shit like that. It was kind of crucial. I was dating this, this Russian girl over there in West Hollywood, she stayed on a, in an apartment in, on Sunset and Poinsettia. And, you know, she was like a big drug dealer. I used to hang out with all the Russians over there. And she was also a prostitute, but I didn't know it at the time because I'm like, was kind of naive and wet behind the ears. And I was like, yeah, when we'd be around other people, she'd be like, you can't tell them that I'm your girlfriend. And I like didn't know that that was abnormal. I was just always been so desperate for acceptance and really wanted a relationship so bad. That's all I wanted. That's all I cared about. And it's never seemed to materialize. But uh, that summer, my, my dad was making a film in a country called Luxembourg. Have you ever heard of Luxembourg before? It's like a historically nameless blip of a nation in between France, Germany, and Holland. And uh, what it is, is essentially it's a place where people go to wash their money. It's the whole country's like a bank and you see like people pull up in limos hop out with an attache case walk into the bank um and i don't know what the fuck they're doing but my pops is making a movie out there and i um went out to visit him and when i was out there i wound up having an overdose on ecstasy and uh i was in my so basically i had taken I popped some pills the night before and I'm supposed to meet up with my parents for brunch the following morning. And uh, uh, I went to bed or whatever, woke up and I was feeling really sick, like abnormal. I, I, I'm used to feeling the after effects of being on ecstasy, but this shit felt a lot different and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But I was, uh, I remember calling my mom, like, we're supposed to meet at like 1 p.m. or like 11, I forget what time. I'd be like, hey, mom, like, I'm gonna be a little late. Can we like delay it an hour? She's like, okay, honey. Then like, it's about to be another hour. And I'm like, I'm still, I'm feeling worse and worse and worse. My heart's leaping out my chest. I don't know what the fuck's going on. I call again, like, mom, I'm gonna need to, can we push it back a little more? I'm still not feeling that good. And she's like, all right, like starting to get a little bit suspicious. They've, they're already like, they don't know what to do with me. I've been terrorizing their existence, you know, for several years at this point, but they're just, they're just hoping I go to college. For some reason, they think that if I make it and I survive this period and go away to college, everything will be okay. I don't know why they had that idea in their head. Maybe because they knew I needed to get the fuck out of LA, which was true. But for some reason, um, they're just like, they, they can't control me. But 
then I'm feeling worse and worse and worse. I call my mom again. It's time to meet up. And she's like, come the fuck down right now. And I remember like, I'm starting to like lose like there's like spatial distortions. Um, I have no equilibrium. I remember looking at the mirror at myself and really all I could see is my own bloodshot palpitating eyes staring back at myself. Next thing I remember, apparently I made my way to the elevator and uh, passed out, like fainted or whatever in the lobby. I wake up and there's a bunch of people speaking some like crucial foreign language over me like while they're reviving me essentially or help and my mom's sitting right there and uh, she's terrified and my mom is like a really sweet demure comforting woman and no matter what like she's just like this beacon of like positivity essentially and I remember saying to her and th this sticks with me to this day for numerous reasons but I remember saying like mom am I gonna am I gonna die and it said, of course, of course, I expect her to be like, no, honey, you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be all right. She looks right back at me and says, I don't know. And that just like, you know, of all the years I've taken off of her life with the dysfunction and pain and anxiety that I've caused, that definitely took a few off of mine. Just that moment, that just sobering reality. Um, I wound up going to a treatment center, a really like high end treatment center in Arizona they shipped me off to called the Meadows. And, you know, there's a bunch of drug addicts there, but it's also for, it's like for all di dual diagnosis and multi addictions, people that have sex addiction or all kinds of stuff were there. And um, like, basically if there's like a rich person who got, gets caught cheating on his wife or a doctor that's prescribing themselves fentanyl or some shit, they can go there and try to like salvage their professional life or their marriage essentially. And, um, I was like a kid in a candy store because there's all these like silicone milfs walking around. I'm essentially like 18 year old jail bait, right? Um, I'm the youngest dude there. Don't let the fucked up uh, teeth and the chunky exterior fool you. I was a pretty boy at the time. I was real cute. Um, you know, sidebar, shout out to my homeboy Omen. He always said, I'd rather be chunky than a junkie. So we'll get into why I got a little bit of weight on me now. It's probably a good thing to some extent. Um, when uh, So I'm at this place and uh, I wind up seeing this. I remember the first day there when like the guys, one of the other patients is showing me around and introducing me to all the other people there. And um, we're going into the laundry room and he's like, oh, that girl that's in there, she's the hottest chick in this entire place. And I saw her and even though she had like her hair tied back and... Um, no makeup on or anything and was like looking downtrodden and it's like her fifth day in rehab. So she's definitely don't have her weather together. She was essential. Uh, I was like, damn, she is fucking gorgeous. And this is the year 2000. So it's like on the tail end of the, the Baywatch era. And she's like a blonde beach looking silicone, um, really hot chick. She's like seven years older than me. And I was like, hard eye emojis popping out of my skull. I was like, damn, that chick's hot. But I didn't think she would ever talk to me. A few days later, I'm sitting by the pool and she like, she's like on the other side of the pool. And then you know those scenes in like movies where like the girl waves to the guy and then like the guy looks behind you like, Who? she can't be talking to me. It's gotta be somebody else. And then you're like, me? And she's like, yeah. And then I was like, that literally happened. And she walks over, we, we talk for like three and a half hours straight wind up making out. Now, keep in mind, for all you guys that haven't been to treatment centers, the number one most frowned upon thing in any rehab besides doing drugs is having any type of sexual interaction or hooking up with anyone. But that's all people are trying to do because, you know, you have drugs. That's like, that's your only vice you have to lean on. When that's taken away, what do you have? Your instinct, like my instinct was just sex. Plus I'm an 18 year old hormonal young guy. Like, so, you know, of course I'm and this, this hot chick. So I instantly fall in love. I have no serotonin because I've been addicted to ecstasy. They're putting me on all these different drugs to try to get my serotonin levels and my dopamine levels uh, stabilized. In the meantime, though, I have this like secret re relationship. We're sneaking around the facility, trying to find like the one place where there's no camera so we could like make out and I could like finger her or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, and it was, um, 
she was seven years older than me um, and um she was one of the original employees of this is like right after the the dot-com boom she was one of the original employees of a company called Netscape, which was one of the original web browsers. She started out as like a secretary, made herself indispensable to the company, had crazy stock options, and was apparently worth millions of dollars. So I was like, I hit the fucking jackpot. This super hot chick has all this money. She's foolish enough to like me because, and, and I'm doing whatever I can to manipulate her into liking me more, writing her poems, lyrics from songs from obscure artists that I hope she doesn't know and I'm pretending it's my poems that I'm writing to her and all this shit, doing whatever I can to endear this woman to me. And um, then uh, when you're in a treatment center like that, they're always trying to recommend an aftercare facility, which is essentially like another rehab center, which is getting a kickback from that rehab center. It's all a fucking racket, it's all a business. And uh, she was recommended to go to this place in New Mexico. And I manipulated the staff and my parents to agree to send me to that same place, obviously without them knowing that she was gonna be there. I wind up, um, they wind up shipping me out like before her, she wound up going home back to her, to her family for a little while before she went. So I'm like there and the whole week I'm there, instead of being a G and keeping my fucking mouth shut, because if I had just kept my mouth shut and not said anything and just, you know, pretended to work this program or whatever, because the whole time I didn't care about being sober. I was just killing time till I could get fucked up again. Any treatment center I've ever been to, it was whether it's by because of my parents, because of whatever woman I'm with, or due to the, you know, the state of California, I never on my own volition wanted to get clean ever. And I would do whatever I could to get fucked up in the meantime, in between time, whether it's fucking snorting drywall, um, making myself pass out. I tried banana peels, toothpaste. If there's drinking Listerine because there's alcohol in it, whatever. Like I, I wanted to get fucked up. Um, however I could beat a drug test, I would do it. Um, so I'm bragging the whole time she's gone which before she's there and I'm bragging to everyone like I got a girlfriend and I think it was again like this intrinsic need for validation like I'm important I'm worthy I deserve a hot girlfriend like she she really likes me and unbeknownst to myself I'm like it's, it's mainly women that are at this place and I've become like this toxic force within their like recovery bubble and I'm just like spreading this negativity and triggering everybody Finally, she gets there within an hour of, be of her being there. They're like, Nick, you're getting, you're kicked out. You're getting shipped off to another place. Then where they sent me was this place in a small town called Prescott, Arizona, called the Prescott House, which is like a hardcore pound you in the ass recovery. Like they're not fucking playing in the slightest. It's an all male facility. And um, most of the people there there's people, regular drug addicts, but that's like the, the vast minority. The most people that are there are there because they're fighting some type of sentence or as a condition of their sentence. So they don't have to go to prison. And a lot of them are for sex charges. So there's people that are there for, there's like this old Mormon guy who was there that had molested his granddaughter. There was um, another dude who had met a 14 year old girl on the internet and seduced her. And has, I actually looked this guy up. He's still on the sex offender registry. Um, there is th all kinds of like, and I'm, I'm in the mix with them. And they have these really strict rules. Like you can't even masturbate. There's rules against masturbating. You're supposed to hold each other accountable, AKA snitch out people for everyone you live with for anything you see that violates their very, very stringent protocol. And um, I was like, this place is fucking hell. Well, I wind up meeting the only time you could talk to girls. And of course, I'm being labeled as a sex addict when I'm really just an 18 year old regular kid with a healthy libido. I'm like, bro, I'm just trying to get fucking laid. And like, but I'm a sex addict because I had, was obsessed with this girl and all this crazy shit. Um, I'm call, when I first got there, I'm like using the pay phone to call the pay phone at the other spot, trying to talk to her like, you need to get me the fuck out of here. Here's the deal. You got millions of dollars. Let's run off together and live an idyllic existence and mosey off into the sunset. At a certain point, she's like, no, this is harmful for my recovery. 
stopped taking my calls, left me completely heartbroken and devastated. So I'm like now facing the harsh, re harsh reality that this is my existence. All I want to do at this point is get back to L.A., but I'm stuck in this little podunk town in Arizona. I wind, the only place you could talk to women is at the AA meetings, and then it's on a super monitored basis. I wound up meeting a girl there who's in like the female version of the place that I'm at. We wind up running away together. I like take the little bit of money that I have because they give you like an allowance of like $50 a week or some shit. And I wind up saving up for a few weeks. We um, start, she has money too. We're like maxing out her cards, all this shit. We're staying in dope fiend motels with monthly rates, wind up meeting people in the little community over there. And um, we start selling acid, start doing whatever we could to get by and hustling and just trying to, trying to make ends meet. I actually had a job for a little while too. I was working at Whataburger, which is not better than In-N-Out for all you Southwestern people. I'm sorry. It's not, but um, that was like, and uh, this girl that I was in love with was a crazy nymphomaniac to the point where, you know, I, she had slept with everybody in the fucking town. Like she couldn't, if you left this girl alone for 10 minutes, if I left and there was another guy there, she would suck his dick. It, it was that crazy. And I was just like miserable, but at the same time, I'm like happy, you know, that I'm, that at least like I'm able to get high. And, um, but my existence is really bleak at that point. I wound up getting an upper respiratory infection and I went to a free clinic to go to the doctor and um, tell the doctor my history, tell him I'm a recovering addict and all that. And this guy, I remember the doctor at the free clinic chuckling to himself and he, when he's like, well, huh, you, uh, if you're a recovering addict, you'll probably like this. He gave me a prescription to uh, codeine with promethazine, cough syrup, um, thing called bar. It was like a, you know, a pint sized bottle. And there was with four refills, I essentially spent the next, you know, month or so, a couple months just in a leaned out daze. You know, I, I had sipped syrup before, you know, growing up, like I, I knew about like DJ Screw and Three Six Mafia and stuff, but this was like the most I had ever been into it like that. And um, I wind up somehow, some way, my drug counselor that I had had back, that I was seeing back in LA winds up coming, snatching me up and sending me back to the treatment center that I was at before. After that, at that spot, I wound up meeting a girl who was from the Bay Area, from a small town named Alameda outside of Oakland. And we kind of struck up a relationship there. And I wound up moving to the Bay Area at um, 19 years old and lived in a series of halfway houses until I finally got my own apartment. And um, my really started actively, I was already actively pursuing my dream of becoming a hip hop artist, but that's when it kind of, when I got my own spot, when it really kicked into high gear. You know, from a young age, I had really, really simple ambitions because I didn't expect to live long. I thought I was gonna die in my early 20s and I didn't care. I, I wanted to, I welcomed death because I figured like it would, you know, James Dean, die young, leave a beautiful corpse type thing. Um, and I, I had no sense of a future. I didn't care or know. And I was so narcissistic that I didn't care who would be the, the family that loves me, my parents, my brother, my grandmother, I didn't care about the pain it would cause anybody if I was dead. And I was such low self-esteem. I kind of was like, they're better off without me. I'm a huge liability. All I do is break their heart, cost them money, steal from them, whatever, you know, steal anything that's not fucking nailed down. Like, but um, all I wanted to do was to like rap on a stage and get, have people say that I was dope. And I wound up achieving that at a super young age. And I was like, so everything after that was essentially a victory lap. And, uh, you know, between the ages of 19 and 38, there was feigned, feigned um, periods of functionality. I had periods of success, but the whole time I'm addicted to drugs. I had, uh, um, you know, I had a, 
I was smoking weed every day since I was 12, drinking habitually, never really got like delirium tremens or like would shake when I didn't drink, but I would feel really agitated when I wouldn't drink. Um, was addicted to all different kinds of pills, primarily benzodiazepines, that's like Xanax and shit, was a big thing for me. I had a huge cocaine phase, a big opiate phase, even a crystal meth phase uh, towards the end of my run. And um, I think the reason why I wound up living is because it wasn't just one drug the whole time. I would eventually kind of substitute addi addictions. And, you know, I had gone through any, everything you pretty much could from um, incarceration, divorce, overdosing several times, being evicted from several homes, being stabbed, being shot at, having hits on my life by different gangs and you know, different criminal organizations, getting kidnapped, um, been getting beat within an inch of my life, being completely demoralized, estranged from my family. Um, none of my friends wanted to let me in a, any close of a cir circumference to them. And uh, eventually I just kind of ran out of steam. And uh, I hit bottom so many times, it was like, right when I thought I hit the bottom, like the floorboards would give way and then I would fall down and hit another bottom. And then I was just like, by this time I'm halfway to the seventh layer of hell. And um, the place I wound up getting clean and sober at, which was um, my sobriety date is February 3rd, 2020. So that's like two years, eight months and 15 days sober or something like that. And oh, I guess it's more, I guess it's 17 days. Um, I, it, it was a pretty hardcore place, but I, I thought prior to that, the, the, it's, it's listed as a facility for chronic relapsers. And I always defined myself as a chronic relapser, but in reality, like I said earlier, I've never had an earnest attempt at recovery. I never wanted to get clean. I was just killing time in between use and it was only for periods of a couple weeks at a time. Once I was left my last facility at age 19, it's like damn near two, two decades of uninterrupted use. And I always just thought that, um, you know, I, I never fucking relapsed because I never wanted to stop. And uh, this was my first time actually trying to work a program, surrendering and making an earnest attempt at recovery. and turning my will and my life over to God. And lo and behold, by the grace of God, I'm still sober. And, you know, um, shortly before I got clean, about, uh, like about 10 months before that, I was about to be evicted from my third apartment. I, I'd been divorced. Um, my apartment was, looked like it got hit by a hurricane. There's just like clothes everywhere. My, you know, my, my bed, I couldn't distinguish if it was the dirty mattress was soaked with my own piss or the dog's piss. I had two chihuahuas um, who I miss very dearly because my ex-wife had them. Um, I have a lot of different dogs that exes have and sucks because no matter what relationship I'm in, eventually they realize that I'm not a suitable person to have kids with or continue on a relationship with no matter how much they love me and they get tired of taking care of me and the relationship inevitably ends. And um, um, at that point, I was pretty much, you know, the crystal meth addiction was going really crazy. Um, it, I was just out of control and I wound up texting this girl I knew on Easter of 2019. And I was like, um, happy Easter. And I put the little star emoji. She texted me back. And for some reason, she we wound up talking. And this is like a girl that really has, she woman that has everything together. She has a master's degree, is doing really well in life, is successful, has a whole career as a singer, um, comes from a good home, lives is from, a, you know, suburban Pennsylvania and all that. And... We wind up falling in love. She moves to LA with me to kind of save my life. And she literally like cleans and organizes my entire life. I'm getting evicted. So she moves us into a new apartment. Um, and all she asks is that I get clean. And um, I'm lying to her the whole time saying I'm trying to get clean. Lying to her about the, 
you know, I'm still popping pills. I said they're doctor prescribed and this is how I'm supposed to get off of the benzos, but they're really not. I'm hiding my crystal meth use and, but she's seeing me looking all like, you know, bug eyed and, eyed and sweaty. And I'm saying, no, this is just me withdrawing from the benzos. Like at a certain point, I'm unable to even be intimate with her because I'm rather just masturbate until my dick is sore and about to fall off. Um, and, um, because I'm taking the rent money and spending it on other shit. I wind up getting, wind up getting us evicted again. She, we, she moves us back to her family's home out in the East Coast. And um, so that's where we stayed. But I needed to go back to L.A. because, you know, in the suburbs out there, it's not like I could go to the corner and find drugs. We're like in a really kind of almost rural area. And I also, you know, I had some loose ends I needed to tie up, but really I needed to get more drugs. So she flies me back to LA and within a month of, month of me being there, I wind up in this treatment center, um, which was in Texas. It was a place called BRC and it wound up saving my life. Um, I was there for four months and then I was in a sober living house for two months. Then um, my fiance and I wound up moving back there and back to the East Coast and I was back and forth since I got clean between LA and out there, things started to go really well for me. And, you know, I was completely dedicated to the program. I'm going to several AA meetings. It was weird because like when I, before I went into treatment, I had heard about this thing called, um, you know, the coronavirus or whatever. I'd heard it mentioned a few times, but when I was in treatment, this global pandemic breaks out and I'm kind of like oblivious to it because, you know, the spot I was at had no technology that we have no access to phones. Uh, we have we're, we're able to make one phone call a week monitored by a counselor and it's only to a person that the counselor chooses. So it's either one of my brothers, my mom, my dad or uh my, my fiance and it's for 10 minutes and monitored that we have no access to television. The only news source we have is newspapers and um, kind of hearing about all this crazy shit that's going on. But it's also kind of like fueling my egocentric drug addict nature. Like, well, I go to treatment and the entire world shuts down. Like, isn't this like, it's because of me, like, isn't this great? And then I got out and it was kind of trippy, but, um, it was a really disconcerting transition to make when I like got re-emerged into society. And I'm kind of grateful that I did it through a sober living house. So it was kind of nice and a little bit more settling and gradual. And, um, you know, I, at that time I had was living a really simple life and I was, I was genuinely happy for like the first time in my life. I remember, um, being at the hotel my fiance was staying at near my sober living house and, so shortly after I'd got out of treatment and there was like $140 on the floor and I picked it up and I found it. I had completely lost sight of my moral compass, but at this point I actually had it again. And I like went to the front desk and excuse me, someone lost this money. And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. Just keep it. And I was like, really? Like, but the fact that my instinct was to return it, like it's, even right now, if I saw that shit, I'm snatching it up. But at that time, I'm really, God is in my heart. I'm operating at a higher vibration, higher frequency. And I'm just like, you know, I was just like really happy. But then the ambition to get back into the world of entertainment and get my hip hop career popping off again and my career as a battle rap host and curator, you know, I had all these opportunities starting to come up and uh, wind up getting my like first real, it wasn't my first record deal, but my first real label deal where I have my own label and um, with my fiance and her brother and I'm back in the mix with the battle rap thing. And then slowly but surely, recovery is taking a back seat. The fact of the matter is this, everybody in life has a pyramid of things that are important to them, whether it's, you know, um, God, um, their family, relationship, work. There's a pyramid that everybody has. For me, I don't have the luxury of having a regular pyramid. My pyramid has to put my recovery first. If I don't have the, if the, the peak of my pyramid isn't recovery, I lose everything else that's important to me. And that's what wind up happening. Um, things were going great. I make, was making more money than I had ever made. In my life, I have all this amazing stuff going on. I feel like, you know, my story is an influence and, a, and, and an inspiration to, 
thousands of people. I have all these people that are so proud of me. All the wrongdoings of my past, you know, not, I did a lot of fucked up shit. I did a lot of fucked up shit. I did shit that I can't talk about because it would incriminate myself or others as well, you know? Um, I don't even want to get into it all, but I can't. I'd love to, to be honest with you, unburden myself and talk about it, but I can't. I really can't. But for the most part, a lot of the things that I had done, I made right. A lot of the um, people that I had harmed, I made amends to them and were chipping away. Like, I, I, I still owe a lot of money, but, you know, like, started chipping away at things like that. I had a genuine relationship with my parents, which, which felt so good, especially because around that time when I was gone in treatment, my mom got, my mom got diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, so, um, which is really painful. And it's crazy because that's the same fate that her mother succumbed to. And when her mother had Alzheimer's, my mom took care of her like really, really in a fanatical way to the point where she like literally raised millions of dollars and changed the met with president obama and changed national policy her and a bunch of other people uh, called the alzheimer's association on how that disease is treated you know what i mean and um she you know her her succumbing to that fate it was really painful but she has had enough wherewithal and memory to know that i was clean and that you know made me feel so good something i want to impress upon all y'all is that Addiction knows no bounds. Addiction doesn't discriminate. Addiction doesn't care about race, class, gender, orientation, socioeconomic status. All of that, all of that is irrelevant. Anybody can be stricken with this fate, with this disease. People like to say that it's not disease. People like to look at it as a choice. Well, you know, diabetes is an affliction as well, right? But depending on what you do and how you take care of yourself that determines the outcome of that. It's the same thing with addiction. If you don't wind up feeding that addiction, you could use it like, you know, it's like a fire hose. And if you direct that fire hose to something productive, you know, you wind up saving burning buildings and could do amazing things in life. If undirected, it's just flailing in all directions, looking like one of those uh, guys, those dolls that what are they called those inflatable inflatable uh statues outside of buildings doing advertising right and that's kind of like what my addiction was but um you know i wound up at a certain point things started going left and um the like i had some money issues came up and i went right back into my old patterns i didn't relapse i never used again but I started with the biggest part of my addiction. The biggest problem I had was honesty. You know, I was been, been a pathological fucking liar. And as honest as I've been during this conversation, there's moments where it's been difficult because it's like my instinct to just not embellish, but just say, I want to endear people to me. So I want them to have a perception of me that I think is going to make me look better than it really is. When in reality, like nothing, resonates with people more than honesty and being genuine. And um, even though I know that intrinsically, it's just like against my nature. And lies are a mechanism that's kept me safe in my addiction in the streets, has kept me out of trouble so many times that it's still, you know, something that I struggle with. Um, but it's something that wound up going bad in my relationship again. The lies popped up again. Um, the volatility, the, um, the instability, you know, stealing and financial mismanagement to the point where this my fiance who had been to hell and back with me thugged it out through all these unimaginable difficulties and unforeseen circumstances finally decided she had enough and decided that we needed to split up so we split up my mother's condition worsens and um i wind up in a really bad situation with my career with the company that i own the battle rap league to the point where like it put me in serious debt and everything went left and got all fucked up and here i am in the midst of my sobriety going on three years and everything was going wrong and i didn't know like what to do back at my parents house and it's crazy because for the first time Throughout, I, I, I was suicidal again. 
I felt really bad. Um, they wound up putting me on medication. I don't know if the medication is what's made me not want to kill myself because I still have really dark days. But at a certain point and through the success that I've had recently with my podcasting, which has gone to the next level and wound up getting like a permanent slot over there and things are really blowing up and just like the interaction and the connection. It's really dangerous to let externals dictate your emotions, whether it's praise or criticism. But for some reason, like that really kept me going. And today for the first time I realized I could be happy even if I don't have this woman I was gonna, thought I was gonna spend the rest of my life with. There is a hope for me. I could have a happy life. I could have this new career. And if I just like really dissect all the intricate layers of lies, this web of lies so intricate that fucking Spider-Man would be jealous of it. If I could cut through that and just focus on what's real, and what I really want to do, and when I say what's real, not, not only being real with other people, but being real with myself and following my genuine passion, then I really have a chance of either getting back with her one day, if that's the, the path, or meeting somebody new and starting a new life and just finding that happiness within. It's not about other people. My instinct is always find validation in others, but I can find it in myself. I can find it with God. And the fact that I stayed sober, clean and sober throughout this whole experience, and here I am now, things are finally starting to turn a corner. If I had been using, and I, and I don't know how to deal with these emotions because the whole time I was clean, I was with her. So I'm like, she's like almost essentially became my higher power. That's what I was leaning on and I wasn't even aware of it. And now I'm actually becoming stronger because I don't have drugs to lean on. I don't have financial stability to lean on. I don't have this relationship to lean on. I have to find this strength truly within for the first time in my life. And it's, I can't tell you how gratifying it is. And if I would have relapsed, I might have temporarily taken the pain. But the way I use, if I just, I can't just have one drink. I can't just smoke a blunt. By the end of the night, I'm going to be popping the pills at best case scenario. At best case scenario, I'm going to wind up methed out in a, in a dope fiend motel, snorting, snorting lines off of a hooker's asshole. And that's at best case scenario. At worst, I'm going to be in, I'm going to wake up in men's central jail or fucking, dead somewhere or in an alley. And that's the, the reality of my existence. I don't have the luxury of using casually. And if I had, and, and if I had, who knows where the fuck I'd be at now. But I stayed clean through this and things are starting to look up. What's been most surprising about, you know, going through this clean patch for you? <sighs> that there is a light at the, end, at the end of the tunnel and that it involves a path that I'm choosing for myself that I'm genuinely passionate about. So much of my existence has been based on people pleasing and catering to the emotions of others. And it's not because I'm this altruistic, I mean, I'm, I'm a nice guy, right? As fucked up and flawed as I am, I have a good heart. But me being kind to other people and doing for others, it's not because I'm this altruistic person is because I want to control their perception of me. I want other people to think that I'm so great. And then maybe one day they'll help me out if I need it. That it's really, I'm giving, but with selfish intentions. And I'm trying not to do that anymore. What, what's surprising is that I actually can be happy and I can be happy by myself. That's like the craziest thing. And the temptation is still there? To use? Oh, the temptation is definitely always there. I mean, I was telling you the other day, I was taking a walk in my neighborhood and I smelt a coat of fresh white paint and it instantly reminded me of cocaine. And I have a lot of thoughts of using something like you. The thought of using uppers isn't as appealing because I, are, I have naturally so much anxiety and I'm so stressed up and stressed out and like wired up as a person. But the thought of like taking some downers and just sleeping peacefully for a long time. And that sounds amazing. I'm not going to lie. Even the thought of smoking weed doesn't sound cool to me anymore. Like I don't think I would be all weird and paranoid, but just taking some pills and just drifting off into a blissful state of dream state. That sounds really appealing. But at the end of the day, the more I immerse myself in my recovery, 
the less tempting it is. Like I'm still around it. The majority of my friends to this day still use. I'm around drugs all the time, around people smoking weed and drinking, you know, when I'm doing the podcast, when I'm hanging out. And I never, am I tempted? Like the idea of it sounds good, but I'm never like, I want to do this right now or I wish I could have a hit. I'm just like, it's kind of crazy, but no, you know, I, I would say that the, res- the obsession has been removed and that definitely can happen. If me, I, I don't like to say this can happen to you because I think giving advice is really pretentious. But for me and for millions of other people, the obsession does get removed. Like I do, I do, I do recoil as if from touching a hot flame from the thought of using. That's great. All right, Nick, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank Super you. Super interesting. I appreciate man. it. Wish you great luck from here on out. Thank you. Thanks, man.